He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 12 Power Couple Clark was nervous going into work the morning after telling Lois that he was Superman. Unsure how she had taken the news, he worried that things might become awkward between them. But when she arrived in the office, it was nothing of the sort. If anything, it seemed they shared a new rapport, both being in on the same inside joke. How about it, Kent? Do you think we can get lunch today? Oh, uh, yeah. Sure. I think. Perfect. I'll take my chances. Clark was curious who this boyfriend was and how long he and Lois had been together. But at the diner, Lois had an entirely other agenda. So, here's the deal. I'm guessing there's a lot more you know than you let on, specifically in how you report on LexCorp. I can imagine you have no way of reporting on it without revealing your identity. Am I wrong? You're mostly not wrong. And it seems to me that I'm going to be under scrutiny whether I like it or not. That's also true. So, I figure I should meet this head-on and start reporting on Luther with you as my informant. That way, you keep your secret and we expose Luther for the crook he is. Are you in? Of all of the outcomes Clark had worried about as a result of telling her his secret identity, he never imagined working together would be among them. Aren't you afraid you'd become even more of a target? Lois rubbed her chin as though she were sleuthing it out. My theory is, if I make enough noise, he won't be able to do anything. Besides, you're always there when I need you. I would hate to keep testing that. We've only been lucky. Jeez, Clark. For someone with unlimited abilities, you sure are being a downer when it comes to seeing potential. I'm not saying no. I just want us to think this out. Consider the possibilities before we rush in. Oh, I have thought this out. I spent all of last night thinking this out. I'm already living with Luther over my shoulder. If we do this right, maybe I don't have to. And maybe the world can be free from one less monster. Come on, Clark. What do you say? Is Superman up for it? Clark agreed, but had to confess. He had no hard evidence. All of what he knew came from what he'd seen and heard through walls. Every scrap of actual proof I had, I put into my stories. I don't have any other evidence. Lois suddenly lost her enthusiasm. All right. Well, apparently I haven't thought this through after all. But how about this? How about I interview Superman? I don't know. I don't think an article of me making claims will help. Okay. Well, maybe we don't have to rush this. I mean, it could take a while to get evidence. So, I see what you're saying now. Lois' excitement slumped for a moment. To cheer her up, Clark grasped for ideas. I might know someone who already has the evidence we need. Might know someone? What's that supposed to mean? Clark was thinking Batman would certainly know all about Luther. But the moment he made the suggestion, he started to regret it. Batman would not approve of his acquaintance being mentioned in a crowded diner. I better not. He's kind of weird about this kind of stuff. Oh? Now I really want to know. Maybe another time. He tried to change the subject. So, who's this boyfriend of yours? Will he approve of this? Richard? He doesn't have to know I know Superman. It's probably for his own good. I don't recommend you keep that a secret. It's the kind of thing that will wreck a relationship. Thanks. Note taken. Now mind your business. Clark agreed to Lois's proposal, but he wasn't so sure it was the best idea. He was afraid they wouldn't find enough substantial evidence, not fast enough to act against Luther before Luther could act against them. Even with his great strength, the two of them might not be able to pull this off. They needed help. And though Clark wasn't sure if he was welcome, he headed to Gotham. This time, when he entered the Batcave, Batman clearly anticipated Superman's arrival when he entered. It's about time. Wait, 
Did I miss something? I thought you didn't want me here. I don't. But you've been in over your head for far too long. You should have never gone to the Omega on your own, and you should have been here by now. Sorry, I was chained under a pile of kryptonite at the bottom of the sea. I know. That was nearly 24 hours ago. You should have come here first. Instead, you went to Star Labs. I don't understand how you always know everything. And I don't understand why you keep insisting on going to Star Labs. They can't be trusted. Oh? And why not? For one, their security is completely vulnerable. Vulnerable to the point that I had no trouble discovering you were there. Is that how you knew about the kryptonite chain? No. Actually, I told him. Jean Jones emerged, phasing through the cave wall. Jean? You two know each other? We met only recently. This is where I brought Rudy's computer and notepad. Batman interjected, walking over to his computer console. We've been working to decipher it. I thought you didn't trust Jean with reading your mind. Jean Jones confessed. I cannot read his mind when he doesn't want me to. He has blocked me. Batman moved the conversation along. Let's not get distracted. We have matters to discuss. Clark agreed. He had many questions. Did you learn anything from Rudy's computer? Batman curtly answered. At this point, it's hardly relevant. We were able to learn what particular technology and material he was providing to the Omega. I was remotely surveying the boat from here when you came and took it, flying it beyond the range of my drones. You saw that? Not at the time. We only noticed it happened after you contacted me to defuse the bomb. Jean Jones answered. Yeah, the bomb that turned out not to be a bomb? That surprised us too, admitted Jean Jones. Batman interjected. I had it counted as a possibility. The materials Rudy had acquired suggested they were building a bomb, but it was far too eclectic of a list for just a bomb. Now that we've seen they didn't use any of the supplies, it seems to me this was all to get your attention. You found the boat? Batman and I went in search of it immediately after I lost contact with you. Though we still hadn't found it when you let me know you were alright. It wasn't until later that night that we found the Omega and captured the crew. That was when I saw it. Their minds had been erased. What? Did Luther wipe their minds to hide the evidence? Jean's eyes were full of grief. No. They had their entire identity stripped months ago and were reprogrammed to think they were terrorists. Batman took over explaining. But they were completely incompetent terrorists. Extortion, weapons trade, and enough big stuff to get noticed. But most of them just marched around mindlessly guarding their boat. What happened to them? Professor Hugo Strange happened to them. Strange is a professor in psychology, specializing in hypnosis. Those poor people. All to set a trap for me? This is what Hugo Strange does. I've been dealing with his handiwork for years. The Scarecrow was a psychiatrist before he started using fear-inducing gases to terrorize Gotham. Mad Hatter was convinced to act out scenes from Alice in Wonderland using his victims as playthings. Poison Ivy was a botanist turned eco-terrorist. The Riddler is a killer obsessed with puzzles and sending me on wild goose chases. All of them are former patients of Professor Strange. Well, I'll be. You've had experience with one of his patients as well. You may remember the Toy Man. Winslow shot? He was one of Strange's patients? You could say that creating the Toy Man was a collaborative effort. What do you mean? Strange altered Shot's mind, but the robotics in his toys were the creation of Professor Arthur Ivo. Whoa, hold on. Are there any other mad professors creating supervillains I should know about? There's also Professor Achilles Milo. Jeez, I thought I was kidding. Batman brought up images on his various monitors. A peculiar man with a bowl cut appeared along with an array of uncanny creatures. Batman looked hard at Clark's reaction. Professor Milo is a geneticist working outside of all ethics guidelines to create creatures. You see nothing like them in Metropolis, but the Flash has had several of them to deal with in Central City, while Gotham has had the Killer Croc and Man Bat. Did they create that Grundy monster too? No. Solomon Grundy was the product of something far more sinister, a magic beyond your comprehension. Who are these people? They are all the descendants of the Light Keepers, like myself. You and Luther? Precisely. They've not been this united since the destruction of Krypton. It still made Clark wince to hear these words. Jean felt his pain, telepathically consoling him as they spoke. Batman went on, despite Clark's discomfort without missing a beat. Seeing a new threat to their power has brought them together once again. Clark had heard enough. 
So how do we take them down? It's not so simple. Their system is fragile. They're poised to destroy themselves. At the moment, control is in Luther's hands. His family took the lead in seeing the Krypton's demise. But while they may be cooperating with each other now, they all want that power for themselves. Then we go after Luther first, right? It's all a matter of timing. How about this? Lois Lane and I are working on an article to expose Luther's corrupt business practices. How about you help us gather evidence? I'm not here to help you and your girlfriend have a trust building project together. She's my ex-girlfriend. She has a boyfriend. I don't need to know this. Clark shrugged. You haven't had many co-workers, have you? It is true. He has not, added Jean. Batman glared at the two of them from under his cowl. Fine. Having taken this possibility under consideration, I'll help you and Lois, but it will only make my plan all the more urgent. And what is that? He believes we must form a league with one another. We have already been in contact with the Amazonian. She is willing to work with us. Hearing Diana mentioned, Superman's heart pounded just a bit faster. How did you find her? Through Jean, obviously. Oh, of course. Clark wished he had thought of this, but he wasn't even sure what he would say to her. He wondered what else they had already accomplished. What about the Flash? And the others in Starling City? I was hoping you would introduce me. I'd love to, and I also have a few other friends I'd like you to meet. Vixen, Black Lightning, and I just met my cousin from Atlantis. I'm not so sure how we go about finding him. He lives under the sea. Batman intended to usher the conversation back to business, but when Superman brought up Atlantis, it perked his attention. Did you say Atlantis? Batman was surprised to learn of a civilization under the sea. This was news, even to him, but it didn't take long for him to include them in his plan. With Jean Jones' telepathic powers, they would form an allegiance of superheroes, calling on one another when needed. But first, Superman had to introduce everyone to Jean Jones. For the Martian to form a significant mental bond with each team member, he had to spend time one-on-one -on -one with each of them. He and Clark met under especially unique circumstances that helped Clark come to trust John Jones quickly. Building that trust with the others would take a bit more time. The other heroes all had different reactions to meeting John. The Flash was totally agreeable to the idea of partnering with the Martian Manhunter. He honestly didn't think he needed help from anyone, even Superman, though he was happy to be there to help the others when needed. In sharp contrast, and probably to be expected, Black Canary and Green Arrow took weeks to agree to the plan to even meet Jean. When they finally got together to discuss it, Wildcat was especially reluctant and vocal in his dissent. I'm not gonna say I like it when I don't. Wouldn't matter if I did. He would be able to read my mind anyway. How do I even know he's not reading it now? Superman looked to Jean Jones for reassurance, but Jean's words might have made matters worse. It is not always a pleasurable experience. I only do it when I have to. Wildcat was older than the other two Starling heroes and played a mentor role to them. He was not as active as they were, but he played a formative part in their lives as heroes. His objection left the others little room for argument. Batman eventually joined Superman and Starling to help persuade them. It seemed to have little effect on the matter, but in the following days, it turned out to be enough. Canary and Arrow finally did come around to Martian Manhunter, but only after Wildcat officially retired altogether. Clark worried that he had somehow splintered their relationship, but any time he asked, they would deny it. Batman wasn't needed to convince anyone else. Mari Jiwei also pounced at the opportunity. She had recently moved to New Apple City for her modeling career and was happy to have more help as a hero. Down in Freeland, Georgia, Black Lightning only needed a little persuading. His experiences with local police and powerful institutions were full of prejudice, but he could see the advantage of joining up with Superman and the others. Okay, Superman. You got me. Maybe being associated with y'all might lend me some of the credibility I can't seem to get. Arriving at Mr. Terrific's headquarters in Motorton City, Superman and John Jones' visit was clearly expected. I noticed the two of you were hitting up the others. I figured it was only a matter of time before you rolled through here. Ray Palmer was no different, totally expecting them and absolutely ready to join the team. Count me in. Sounds like fun. Finding Clark's Atlantean cousin, Arthur, proved to be far more difficult than he expected. Superman dove through the waters near where they met, yet saw no sign of him or the fabled Atlantis. Giving up the search, Clark turned to Martian Manhunter. Last time he said the fish told him where to find me. Can you communicate with fish to relay the message? I can try. 
Hovering above the water alongside Superman, Jean Jones touched two fingers to each of his temples, focusing his mind on the sea life below them. This time, not buried in kryptonite, Clark found Arthur's arrival came infinitely faster. At the water's surface, the three of them, Clark, Arthur, and Jean Jones, talked about the idea of Arthur joining their league. I don't know, Martian man. Do you even know how to swim? When I lived on Mars, the planet still had water. So I do not need to swim. I can phase through matter. Now that is gnarly. Okay, yeah, sure, I'm in. On his way back from Metropolis, Superman got a call from Jimmy Olsen on his communicator watch. Jimmy was in trouble. Some high-tech robbery had gone awry. The thief, being pursued by police drones, managed to damage the railcar track Jimmy was riding on. When Superman arrived, the small train was dangling in the air from the broken track. It had little time left when he caught it and lowered it to the ground. Superman called out to see if his friend was alright. Are you okay, Jimmy? Sure am, Superman. Thanks again. As Superman flew away, throngs of commuters in the rail car turned to Jimmy, pretty impressed by this young man in a tweed blazer. A number of them were impressed enough to ask for the autograph of Superman's pal. Clark had no time to amuse himself by watching Jimmy at this moment. He had to find this tech thief who could damage a train rail. An explosion not far away told him where to look. The culprit had made it into the industrial district. He was being chased by a police drone and had taken cover in a metal refinery. The employees were racing out of the building, running for their lives. Superman slowly went in, surprised to find the fugitive waiting for him. It was John Corbin. I guess you got me, Superman. I'm not too big of a man that I can't admit defeat. I surrender. Come take me away. Corbin held out his hands, as if to be handcuffed. Clark approached him, wary of his game. I have no reason to restrain you if you're willing to give yourself up. How open-minded of you, stupid man. Lean in closer. I want to tell you something truly mind-opening. Superman stopped just in front of him. What is it, Corbin? Clark had no experience to prepare himself for the speed and force that Corbin hit him with. His fist rose and came down in one swift movement connecting to the top of Clark's head, pummeling his face into the concrete floor. Before he could stand, Superman was kicked upright, grappled by Corbin, and thrown out of the refinery's hangar doors and into the nearby police drone surveying them. Superman rushed back into the battle, yet he could not calculate the speed Corbin moved at. Caught right across his cheek midair by a backhanded slap, Superman was thrown into the side of a massive crucible of molten metal. His head rang with a unique sense of pain. While still straightening himself, Corbin met him again with another punch, knocking him back into the precarious molten vat. Though uninjured, Clark was severely dazed. The blows repeated as Clark tried to orient himself. Slowly, he became aware of the glowing green light in front of him. In a surreal vision that gave Clark such pause that he wondered if he was dreaming, he saw that a panel had opened in Corbin's chest, exposing a large cubic block of kryptonite mounted inside of him. The rapid-fire succession of Corbin's punches persisted. Each one left Clark's consciousness sputtering, gasping for his own senses. Clark reached out to restrain his attacker, but with each attempt, Corbin batted away his arms. The mounting futility welled inside of him. In desperation, Superman flailed himself back, away from Corbin. His tumultuous effort smashed him into the imposing vat behind him, unleashing a molten flow that overtook them both. If anything, The glowing melted metal was a relief for Superman. Surrounded by its warmth, he let it carry him as it spilled all over the refinery floor. In a slump, it deposited him against a nearby wall. It took a moment for Clark to put together what had just happened. When he realized Corbin had been swept up in the liquid metal, Clark attempted to sit up. If Corbin had somehow survived, he would need Superman's help. Yet when Clark managed to look around, he caught one fleeting glimpse of Corbin, Silhouetted in the hangar door, he appeared almost skeletal. Only then, as he collapsed back into the metal, did it occur to Clark that he should have contacted John Jones minutes ago. He could have really used some help. No doubt, the Flash could have gotten to Metropolis in that time. Clark scolded himself, asking for help with something new to him. Recuperating all weekend, laying in bed in his tiny Metropolis apartment, Clark dwelled on where he had gone wrong. As a reporter, Working with others was a necessary part of the process. As a superhero, the occasional coordination with firefighters was the most teamwork Superman could usually expect. There were few problems he could not solve on his own. For the problems beyond his own abilities, 
Clark didn't always know who to turn to. He found refuge from this feeling by making visits to the Batcave a regular part of his routine. He and Batman worked together poring over all Batman had on Lex Luthor, LexCorp, and all its affiliates. They dug into Project Adonis and the many deaths and cover-ups surrounding LexCorp's experimental technology. Batman had a network of informants. Unable to imagine any of them cooperating, he objected. None of them are going to talk to a reporter, especially not one as high profile as Lois Lane. And none of them are going to follow through and testify in court. Maybe they'll talk to me. These people respond to fear. They talk to me because they're afraid of me. The two of them went back and forth, rarely agreeing on how to solve their dilemma of compiling a case against Luther. Even without a solution, they worked together around the clock, organizing the information and combing through it for potential informants. When Clark was at the Daily Planet, Lois was eager for any news. She waited until she could catch him alone. Any word from your informant? Uh, he's less of an informant and more of a specialist. Oh? Now I'm dying to know. Who is this you're talking to? I don't know if we should be talking about this right now. Oh, we're fine. Tell me. Clark looked around and listened to every movement in the office. Leaning in close to Lois, he whispered, It's Batman. Shock exploded across Lois's face. You're kidding me! Of course not. He's a very serious person. I don't think he would appreciate me kidding about him. Lois laughed, gaining control of herself to ask, But seriously, what are you learning? Clark scratched the back of his neck while avoiding eye contact. I don't know if it would be appropriate to talk about it yet. There's still a lot of stuff up in the air. Okay, but when can you tell me? Clark had no satisfying answer for her. Months went by and the best he could offer Lois when she asked for an update was two thumbs up followed by a quick exit. Batman and Superman meanwhile mapped out Luther's business with a precision that Clark thought would impress his mentor at the Daily Planet, Ron Trout. Yet no matter how many details they thought they understood, the two of them argued over methods of securing informants. They were working late on Christmas Eve when Clark asked Batman if he and his adopted son had plans for the holiday. Alfred has taken Dick skiing. I may meet up with him later in the week. Well, I can't leave you here to spend Christmas alone. Come have dinner with my folks and I. In Smallville. Am I supposed to fly my bat wing and land in the field? No, come as Bruce Wayne. They know I'm Bruce Wayne. They know how to keep a secret. Apparently a skill they neglected to teach you. Ha ha, just come to dinner. It won't kill you. I can fly us. You're not suggesting you carry me, are you? Sort of. You have plenty of cars. Pick one of them. Turn it on. Crank up the heater and I'll carry it. I probably shouldn't intrude. Nonsense. They were the ones to suggest it. I can't believe you talked to your parents about me. Oh sure. They love to hear about my life. Batman sighed and resigned himself to attend the Kent family Christmas dinner. To not gain too much attention, Clark set the car down on an empty road and they drove the final mile or so. As they arrived, Clark noticed the lights were off in the house next door. The Langs weren't home this year. His disappointment at not seeing Lana didn't last more than a second. Martha and Jonathan were quick to greet Clark and Bruce at the door when they finally arrived at the farmhouse. Jonathan greeted the billionaire. Welcome, Mr. Wayne. Please, call me Bruce. Dinner was marvelous, and besides finding them charming, Bruce appreciated that the Kents kept conversation focused on business. Eventually, their talk led back to how they would persuade their informants to testify. Martha was eager to solve this dilemma. Have you considered just having Clark talk to them? Bruce clearly didn't expect her to have any new ideas. Of course we have, but these people aren't going to be persuaded so easily. Martha was no less stubborn and persisted with her line of thinking. How can you be sure of that? Bruce scoffed. Persuading these people is what I do. Martha looked at Bruce with a motherly concern. Bruce, do you have many friends in your life? My life doesn't have need for friends. Jonathan spoke up after swallowing his bite. And yet, here you are at our table having dinner with us. I think you'd be surprised at just how persuasive Clark can be. Martha caught Bruce a bit speechless. He leaned back, smiled, and continued to eat his pie. In the days after Christmas, Batman agreed to introduce his informants to Superman. Once he did, their progress went faster than he had ever imagined it could. Meeting Superman was like a revelation for many of these informants. They all carried a great deal of guilt and felt a relief from confessing this to Superman. 
Some of them broke down and wept as he comforted them in his arms. His presence gave them a sense of security. They felt safe opening up to him, knowing he could protect them. Having secured a myriad of witnesses turned informant, Clark came to Lois to fill her in on the plan. He had all of their connections to Luther mapped out in such detail that she was honestly disappointed to see it. No fair! You and Batman did all the work and left nothing for me to do but interviews. It's like I'm some kind of intern, and I'm just supposed to slap my name on this? Clark shrugged, not bothering to hide his guilt. I hope that's not a problem. Lois huffed, but went through with the plan with no more complaints. Nearly all of the informants that Superman met agreed to talk to Lois and testify in court when the time came. Superman gave them all his emergency number just in case. Batman was truly astonished at what Superman had brought out in people. After months of interviews, Lois shook the world with her mind-blowing expose. She was praised for connecting years of LexCorp activity to a gamut of crimes, ranging from industrial waste to homicide. Repeatedly throughout the article, she demonstrated a direct connection to not just LexCorp, but Lex Luthor. Her plan was working. Luthor was removed as CEO of LexCorp. In addition, multiple nations opened up their investigations and filed charges against him. When his assets temporarily froze, Clark thought they finally had him. Yet before he could be brought into custody, Luthor vanished. Without a trace or penny to his name, the billionaire was gone. Thank you for listening. I'm Isaac Bluefoot. Sign of L is written and produced by myself. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC comics and characters, originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, with additional contributions by Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Joseph Samichson, Joe Serta, Lou Sayer Schwartz, Robert Kaniger, Sheldon Moldoff, Dick Sprang, Don Cameron, Ed Dabratka, Gardner Fox, Mike Sikowski, Alfred Bester, Paul Reinman, William Moulton Marston, Harry G. Peterson, Carmine Infantino, Dennis O'Neill, Dick Dillon, Mort Weisinger, George Papp, Erwin Hansen, Tony Isabella, Trevor Von Eden, Jerry Conway, Bob Oxner, John Ostrander, Tom Mandrake, Julius Schwartz, Gil Kane, Paul Norris, Robert Bernstein, and Al Pastino. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by Blue Dot Sessions, Bio Unit, Vortex, Kyle Preston, Abstract Nostalgic Fractal Systems, Scanglobe, Neo Normalism Crew, Chad Crouch, Kai Engel, Siddhartha Corsis, Jari Pitkanen, and Audio Binge. See the episode notes for details. If you're enjoying this audiobook, please recommend it to friends and write a review. I can't tell you how much it helps. Another way to show your support is at patreon.com slash bluefoot. For more of my work, get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com. Games with minimal rules and no way to lose. And be sure to listen to the next episode, Chapter 13, Manhunter.